Hello, these notes are for Monday. The, what will Monday be? Um, the, I'm trying to think what Monday will be, the 14th. There we go, Monday the 14th. So we're just gonna continue with our derivative uh, review. So I'm gonna share my screen for you. We'll just pop right on here and get her done. So we left off last week right here with the MVT and we had done a related rate and particle motion is next and we're going to skip that because in BC it's not because it's not important it's because it's very important we'll do a whole unit on, on parametric functions um, and those are like particle motion on steroids so we'll review all of particle motion um, later in the year. So we're at the point where we're going to go through some examples. So we'll just do those together here and you should be writing in your note packet. Again, if you didn't pick one up in class, it was linked on the Friday slide. So write the equation, maybe Thursday, just go check for it. Write the equation of the tangent line. Remember, we always need a point and we always need a slope. So it says that x equals 3, so our point is 3 comma, and then we need to go plug this in, and I didn't bring a calculator into this room, did I? I didn't, crap, so I'm going to do it by hand. You know what, maybe the, oh, I'll just do it by hand, I suppose. So that'd be 1 third of 27 or 9 minus 9 plus 21 minus 2. And so that's going to be 19. There's my point. My slope is the derivative. It is f prime of x at x equals 3 or f prime of 3. So I need to take the derivative, good old power rule, bring it out front, kills off the 3 in the denominator, so I would have x squared minus 2x plus 7 is my f prime of x, and I need to find that at 3. So I have 9 minus 6 plus 7 equivalently 3 plus 7, which is 10. Again, I'm not done. A lot of times what kids will put for the equation of the tangent line is the slope of the equation, the tangent line. Remember, the slope of the tangent line is the derivative. It's not an equation. Uh, it is merely a number of the slope. So on that cubic function, whatever it might look like, maybe it looked like that, we were hopping on it way up at 319. We found the slope of the tangent line to be quite steep, and we're gonna write an equation for that green line. We'll say y minus the y we know is equal to the slope there times x minus the x we know. So this right here, and don't bother solving it for y, you can leave it in that form. And then it says, this was, I clipped these off of a circuit that I'm not going to give you. Um, I clipped the hardest ones off. I think the circuit would have been kind of easy. Uh, to advance in the circuit, use the tangent line to approximate f of 2.9. So remember, I'm going to, hop on here just to the left of three at 2.9. I'm gonna hop on the tangent line and because I'm staying so close to three, I'll have a really good approximation for the actual value on the curve there. So I just take that 2.9 and stuff it in for X. So the Y value there is going to be approximately 19 plus 10 times 2.9 minus 3, and I'm not going to go calculate that out. So this is the graph of two line segments and a semicircle, and it's showing the derivative. So remember last year, I always said, make sure you label that graph so that you know you're staring at the derivative of the function. So right here, since the slope of the tangent line is 0, and slopes are derivatives, it would be the derivative of the derivative graph. So that's where f double prime equals zero. So I used to say last year, make sure you're on the right level, guys. So it says on what open interval is f both concave up? Well, for f to be concave up, f double prime has to be greater than zero. But then what does f prime have to do? f prime has to be increasing so that its slopes, f doubles, are positive. Oh, sorry, it said concave down. Cancel that. F double prime have to be less than zero. So F prime's slopes would have to be negative, um, decreasing, so that F double prime is negative. So we're looking for where this graph is going downhill. It's only happening actually from here to here. 
and increasing. Well, for a function to be increasing, its derivative has to be positive. Well, the y values are my derivative. This is the graph of f prime. So for f prime to be greater than zero, we're looking above the x-axis. So we will be both above the x-axis while decreasing, which look like, looks like it's on the interval from zero to, um, that must be two, I guess. Does it say what the radius is of the semicircle? Let's assume that's a two, huh? To advance in the circuit, at what points concave down and increasing? Just did that. All right, we did this one already. I did that one um, in the last set of notes that you were supposed to watch. So find the minimum value for the function f of x equals x e to the x minus. I'm just gonna go graph it and look, you want to have a graphing calculator for one like this, so that won't be helpful. Uh, let's go take a look. Um, to find where function has absolute and relative extrema, we first need to find its critical values. Anywhere where the derivative equals zero or does not exist. So we'll use the product rule on this to take the derivative. We have first d second, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, plus second d first, the derivative of x is one, and as stated last year, always factor. Okay, that is my derivative. It'll supply me with one critical value at x equals negative one because that's what's making the derivative zero. Remember, derivative, slope of the tangent line, when it's zero or does not exist, our derivative exists everywhere, it has no issues. Remember to look for where it doesn't exist, we look at where the denominator of the derivative equals zero, and this derivative doesn't have a denominator. So uh, I would call it last year, said it's all nice and smooth and roly poly. All right, so x equals negative one supplies me with the only critical value on the entire domain of this function. So I am going to go right here. Now, the minimum value though is the y value, right? Like if I said, what's the minimum if this was at one, uh, negative 10, you'd say the minimum of the function, the functions, the y values is negative 10. So we need to go back to the original function, find f of negative one, it will equal negative one e to the negative one. Okay, so this is the point at where we reach a minimum of negative one over e. I'm assuming, uh, but it did say to what does it say? Confirm. So to confirm it, we'll use a sign line. We will test and we're going to see what happens with the derivative. We're going to go to the right of it. I like zero and I'll put a zero in here and it's positive. We'll go to the left, maybe negative two. And although e to the x is positive for all x, um, to the left of negative one, we'll have all negative. So I am confirming that on the entire real number line, first of all, there was only one critical value at x equals negative one. I confirmed that that was where f prime was negative. So f was decreasing and then increasing. And that's the only place where it happened. So it has to be the absolute minimum. Again, when it says the maximum, means the absolute maximum, and this is giving me an interval. So it's not on its entire domain. So remember last year we said absolute extrema on a closed interval occur either at critical values or at the endpoints. You'll see that this critical value supplied me with the absolute maximum of that weird looking thing, and this endpoint supply me with the absolute minimum. So we need to consider both endpoints. And you might, again, say, I'm just gonna go graph it. And look, you wouldn't have a calculator for one like this. So that wouldn't be particularly helpful and just get the task completed, but you won't learn anything. So let's go up here and evaluate the height at negative one. I'd have 12 minus natural log of negative one squared plus one. And then I'd have 12 minus natural log. And again, I'm not, taking out a calculator because I know I won't have one. So if I don't have a calculator, I know that when I'm all done, my analysis should be numerically clear, if that makes sense. Like I don't really need to, I doubt I really need to know what 12 minus the natural log of two is, because otherwise I'd have a calculator. I'm just gonna be comparing uh, what's the biggest of the values on this table. So um, that'd be 12 minus natural log 26, it looks like. Don't care what it is, don't worry about it right now. 
All right, so my critical values occur anywhere where the derivative equals zero or does not exist. So let's go take our derivative. The derivative of a constant is always zero. I have the negative uh, one out front. The derivative of the natural log of u is u prime over u. Now, when I have a quotient as my, or a fraction as my derivative, and I'm looking for critical values, I have to analyze where's the derivative zero. So I, crap. So I look at the top. Derivative uh, will equal zero only when x is zero, or where doesn't it exist? So I do need to consider the bottom, but x squared plus one is positive for all real x, so that doesn't supply me with any critical values. So I'd have 12 minus the natural log of zero squared plus one. Natural log of one is zero. So you know that natural log of two is positive. Natural, you might say, how do you know that? Remember the natural log, this is the point one zero. It goes like this. So we're positive everywhere to the right of um, one. So this will shrink this from 12. This will shrink from 12. This is 12. So this is my absolute maximum. But the maximum value is 12, not zero. So the maximum. Now, if you were on the circuit, I bet there was an answer that was zero, and that would have thrown you off circuit. So be careful with that. Back to limits because we love them. And one that you know, uh, uses L'Hopital's rule because that's something on the Google Forms you, some of you have indicated you would like some more work on. So upon direct substitution of a zero in for theta, it supplies me with tangent of zero over natural log of one. Natural log of one is zero. Tangent of zero sine over cosine, sine of zero is zero. Cosine zero is one, zero over one, no shocker, it's zero. But I always do that. Uh, last year on the P exam for the one I was a grader for, um, again, there are so many different forms of the test, but I only read one form of it. The last question was a limit, and a lot of the kids assumed it was L'Hopital's rule, and it actually wasn't. Upon direct substitution, you got like a 10 over four or something like that. So be careful with assuming. Uh, there were many kids across the world who um, just assumed it was zero over zero, did L'Hopital's, and it was actually way easier than that. So we take the derivative of the top, the derivative of tangent is secant squared, times the derivative of the guts. So again, what we're doing is the derivative with respect to theta of five theta. When I do the guts, this comes out front. I have five d theta d theta. It's just five. It's just like a, it, theta is the new x in this problem. All right, so on the bottom, the derivative of the natural log is u prime. d theta, d theta is one. So the derivative of the guts is one, or u prime, over u. Let's erase all my chicken scratch over here. And let's clean that up. That'll equal limit as theta approaches zero of five secant squared by theta times the reciprocal theta plus one. Now upon direct substitution, I get zero secant squared zero, one over cosine squared zero. Cosine zero is one. You should be good with all that from last year in pre-calc. So I really have the five times theta plus one. Again, the five came from the derivative of the guts on my chain rule. And theta plus one will give me two. So the answer is 10. Next up, a good old mean value theorem. Remember, in its hypothesis, the function must be continuous and differentiable on the interval given. So think of the square root of x. It looks like this. We're going to be analyzing it on the interval from 9 out to 25. Um, this is continuous, and it is differentiable okay, on that interval. So f of x is differentiable, aka smooth, no asymptotes, all that good kind of stuff, is differentiable and continuous, or you could even say and therefore continuous, but it's both, and you have to state both, is differentiable and continuous. Therefore, uh, we can apply the mean value theorem, correct? The mean value theorem says that there has to be a place where the average rate of change, also known as the slope of the secant line, is equal to the instantaneous rate of change, also known as the slope of the tangent line, at least one spot. 
let's pretend I hit that. Our goal is to figure out where does that happen. So let's go slope 10. All right, slope of the secant line is just slope of a line from algebra one, f of b minus f of a over b minus a, change in y over change in x. So it will be the square root of 25 minus the square root of nine over 25 minus nine. That's going to have to equal the slope of the tangent line, which is the derivative. The derivative of x to the one half, or the square root of x, is one half x to the negative one half. We memorized that one last year, so hopefully that should be in your memory, right? Um, so I end up with two times two root x, four root x is equal to 16 times one. I get root x has to equal 16. No, I don't, four. <laughs> so then I get x is equal to 16, all right? And the x is the location of the value that satisfies the condition of the mean value theorem. And there was only one. So here we go, is this the second to last one? Yeah, this isn't taking too long, is it? Hopefully, <laughs> I don't know, this isn't too long to me. All right, this is fun, I like calculus, it's a blast. All right, so remember, always label this. This is the graph of f prime. Um, it says, for what value does f of x have an absolute minimum on the closed interval from negative 4 to 4? All right. So remember, for an absolute minimum, it can occur at the endpoints or at the critical values. The critical values are where the derivative equals zero or doesn't exist. Now, this is the graph of the derivative. So uh, the y values are zero here and here. So negative two and two are candidates. Now, at negative two, x equals negative two, I should actually write. At x equals negative two, f prime changes from negative to positive. What that would mean is f went from decreasing to increasing. So that provides us with the location of a relative min. And again, we would write this better if we were doing it super formally, but at x equals um, two, f prime changed from positive to negative. Therefore, Two is the location of where f went from increasing to decreasing. So f must have had an a relative maximum. So let's go back to the question. I forgot what it asked me to find. On the closed interval, the absolute minimum. So a relative max is not a candidate. Negative two is. Um, it's a critical value where the derivative changed from negative to positive. So consequently, the function went from decreasing to increasing. Also, we have to consider the endpoints. But watch what happens here. F decreased because it was negative till it hit zero. And then it increased all the way to a relative max and then continued to increase. Again, we're looking at the derivative. The derivative was negative, so F decreased. The derivative is positive this whole way, so f was increasing everywhere to the right of negative two, except at two, actually. Um, but that means this had to have been the lowest it ever was because f only increased from there on out because f prime was positive. There's actually a plateau right there, right? Anyway, let's go take a look at our implicit differentiation. This doesn't have a directive on it. It would have said to find dy dx, also known as y prime. And we know it's implicit because it's not y equals an explicit function of x. I'm going to put that work up here. And then that's my last one for today. Um, so remember with our implicit differentiation, we take the derivative of both sides with respect to x. The derivative of a constant is zero. Remember graphically y. y equals seven is this horizontal line. Up at seven, its slope everywhere, aka its derivative is zero. Okay, cool. All right, here we go. So this is a product. It requires product rule first. dy dx, d second, which is y prime, plus second, 
d first, the derivative of x squared with respect to x is 2x, dx dx, just 2x. Um, first d second plus second d first plus ditto. First d second, dx dx is one, plus second d first, two y times dy dx is getting in the way. We'll go put that right there. All right, so where was I? I did um, first d second plus second d first. I brought the two out front, dropped it down, and then I'd have dy dx. So I'd have two y y prime minus two. Then I keep all y prime terms on this side. So I'd have that guy. And then I'd have plus two x y y prime. That guy is going to equal, move everything over to minus two x y minus y squared. Uh, we, did I forget? Yeah, I forgot a prime. We factor that y prime out. If I'm making any little manipulative mistakes, just fix them. I think I'm fine. All right, so then I'll divide both sides by the x squared plus 2xy. So it'd be 2 minus 2xy minus y squared, all divided by x squared plus 2xy. All right, that's it. That will give you the slope anywhere. And remember I said implicit functions usually, they're not functions, they're expressions. Usually when you graph them, like if you were to go to Desmos and graph this, usually you get something that's, first of all, it's not a function, um, but to find the slope anywhere, it's dependent upon both the x and the y coordinates. Um, so you plug like if this was the point negative one, four, which I don't know if that even works out to be seven. So this is just for shits and giggles. Um, if you plug that into this expression, you'll get the slope of this tangent line. Okay. So I believe then it moves on for some integration. Look out guys. <laughs> so anyway, you guys have a good one. That's it for now. I need to I'm on Zoom and on my iPad, and so there's a lot of button pushings, but I'm going to end the recording, and I will see you this week in class.